This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today I'm with Aaron Norris, and yeah. we're, we're kind of joint hosting. Yeah, we're talking a little bit about turmoil. Um, <laughs> the start of the, uh, we're, it's the, the process is turmoil and I think it's a good thing. I'm really excited about, um, we were about to send out a mailer this week and then luckily we had a conversation last Friday and we sort of completely switched gears this week. So it's been busy on top of doing all the research necessary. So I'm excited where we're going. I am too. There's a, there's a lot of things that are coming up that are going to be changing. And, uh, so obviously one of the things that we'll cover are the real estate stats as we are in. In California, look forward from from that perspective. And uh, but exciting, uh, we have access to a lot of stats that we've never had before for Florida. So we'll be able to take a look at Florida's um, trends and see if we can make the same type of conclusions that we've been able to do in California. This is their history. This is where they are. This is where they're likely to go. Yeah, we found over the last year it's a lot more difficult to get long term data in Florida, partly because they're version of the California Association of Realtor, they stopped collecting some data and pushed it down to the counties and it's very inconsistent. And then their version of, we just haven't found a good version of their uh, uh, real estate research council out there, but John Burns has sent you a bunch of stuff. So that's going to be really interesting to see. Yeah. That's all broken down by, not by state. It's broken down by the MSA. Yeah. And so that's very specific. And then we have other things we have, um, like a historical land price, which is very illuminating when yeah. you look at the lot cost and the amount of lots that were sold. And that's the, one of the things that's comforting about, about being in Florida is that it generally isn't California. It doesn't go boom and bust and boom and bust. It had the one like every place did pretty much with the nonsense that went on in 2002 to 2006. But prior to that, it had not. It was really a mimic of the national chart. Mm -hmm. and it's back on course, ba basically not even at national price. What's, what's really comforting about Florida's median price is the FHA loan limit for Florida is about 20% higher than the median price, Yeah, which is very unusual. Yeah, I was looking at that because they updated those numbers, and I went back and looked at all, you know, California, we create a chart whenever they do that to look at the, the different cities and what that will buy you, and uh just comparing it to Florida. So what we're building out there is, you know, I think the most expensive thing a lot of our investors are building as far as a single family is 250 retail and their, their FHA limit up there is upwards of over, so over 300,000. 300, yeah. yeah. So it's nice to have that, that room. So, yeah, it's construction there is just so different. And that's why we've been, we're exciting excited to participate in transferring some of what we've owned to there. Yeah. Because you put the pieces together, usually in California, you're going to approach 150 grand with the building lot and the permit. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, you know, you're talking about probably 25 grand with the permit in the lot. Yeah. Totally different ball game. Well, it, you know, working on this report, um, it was clear fairly early on. I would say I, I'm writing an email right now that has to go out for this week and sort of, I would say we're 35% done with the research and putting the report together. Um, and then <laughs> we realized the big portion of it is this wild cards chapter yeah. that we're really blowing up for the first time this time. And it's in going to incorporate just by the fashion of what we're going to cover a lot of politics and a lot of the how to side, just because for those staying in California, it's definitely going to get more of a challenge to, f I don't, think we're going to be talking a lot in 2020 about finding deals as much as creating deals. Mm -hmm. I see 2020 is definitely, you're, you're on the cusp of quadrant four. Let's describe quadrants really quick. For, okay. Some people have never heard of that term before. Okay. Uh, quadrant four is where your price progresses and it gets right to the brink of where it's probably going to stop. And then it goes into quadrant one. So quadrant four is you're pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. You're buying things. Everything you hold has gone up for the last you know, five years or more mm -hmm. and you get to a point where it doesn't make sense maybe to buy a new rental because it doesn't cash flow. It wouldn't make any sense. And then you start thinking, okay, hmm, maybe it's going to change directions. Maybe this stuff I own, like, like I did in Marino Valley, bought it for 
64 grand, sold it for 280. Area had improved, wasn't safe. <laughs> and um, the house did get older. <laughs> yeah, an older house. So yeah, you have a 40 year old house in a rut bed area. So should you go through that journey of it coming back down again? And the answer was for me, no. So that's where the idea of the new houses in Florida came in. Mm -hmm. So quadrant one is a pause before you get to quadrant two, which could have decline. And that'll just depend on how aggressive foreclosures get or legislation. And that's, that's what's neat about what we're doing is we're taking a look at this and it's, we really need to pay attention more outside of real estate this time to what could be changed about rules. And that's, it's kind of cool that we're bringing in a panel of experts because there's things that I didn't know could be done without the vote of the people. Like last year, yeah, we voted against the year before we voted against uh, rent, rent control. control and then we have it. Yep. I would really like to know what else is, what else could be possibly touched that we don't think is touchable. Agreed. And the 18 bills that um, the last two shows we've had John Aronson on talking, dissecting the bills specifically to ADUs. And I think there was a total of five because we went back and recaptured one from August. And that was the HOA one where the state reached all the way in past the planning department and then also through the HOAs and CCNRs and said, yep, have to allow them. That's amazing. (laughs) It's incredible. Um, there's no case law. I've heard rumors that, you know, state uh, cities are going to end up suing the state. They're not happy about it. They're not hiring more people in the planning department, but they've got 60 days to get these things through the pipeline or it's considered approved. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, we covered that quite a bit last couple of weeks. But the, the California, uh, just the legal process and how our government works out here. We're extremely left-leaning, and uh, the panel that we're putting together, we're, we're creating sort of two new segments. It's the profits and politics and the profits and progress. And the, the profits and politics, we want to bring together, we're getting close to finalizing the panel, but the Builders Association, the Association of Realtors, and the uh, Apartment Association, putting together a panel to talk about, okay, the 18 bills that passed, what does that look like? Why did something sneak through on rent control when we just as a state voted it out? Hardly, by the way, over 60% yes. of the population said no to rent control. Right. How did it end up passing in October? And how watered down were the bills that went in, into effect in January? Most go into effect in January. So I really want to hear from them how they help water down because I know these are the people that are doing it. And for mom and pop real estate investors, we have to be slightly dangerous in a lot of things, but it doesn't mean that we're absolutely tied in um, to the the lobbying process. So you've got uh, an elected who has, you know, two to four year cycles to get reelected and they don't necessarily have a long term view. They don't really care. They're just, you know, unfortunately, that's just the nature of how things work. Right. Um, we're in affordable housing crisis. So we happen to have gotten some cool goodies out of this one. But 2020 is going to be a very contentious election cycle. It's probably going to be a record turnout. And uh, with that will come a lot of people who might not be homeowners and who really don't care because <laughs> affordable housing is on the ticket. So uh, one of the things that we've talked about is the concept of, OK, we've got rent control now. Um, some more is going to come back in 2020 to talk about things like uh, no cause evictions um, to where you can never get out of rent control, where even if somebody moves out, you can't raise the market rent. It's always sort of going to be stuck in that cycle if you've got a property over 15 years old. You know, you're going to want to know that. But as an apartment owner, if they start messing with Prop 13, you've got rent control and you get the double whammy of them starting to increase um, taxes on you. Yeah. It's not just starting at increase. That's going to get reevaluated to Mm -hmm. today's value. So this building was bought intentionally when it was on sale right at three nineteen, and, um, it had one time been worth nine fifty. So the tax bill at one time was three times what it is right now. So prop 13 could change that drastically. Right. And here's, there's ramifications for that because some, uh, triple net leases, matter of fact, almost all triple net leases, inherently say that if I get a surprise tax bill, I pass it on to the renter. Eesh. Well, that may or may not be a bearable. Right. So you could end up w- with big vacancy factors. Especially if it's a timed with a recession. That's right. So that's, there's just a lot of moving parts next year. Mm-hmm. And so there's, and so you have a lot of willingness. You're going you're gonna to have a lot of need for, okay, where do we find extra dough? Yep. Because you're going to have yields really low. You have a recession. You're going to have you're going to have a lot of people whose whose retirements are going to start not 
coming through with what they thought. Those, those are going to be changed, and that's going to grow in momentum. Well, that's part of the turmoil is the, gosh, I thought that was a promise. Yeah, and looking at the numbers. It's, it's several trillion dollars of mm. money at stake, and it, from what I understood, it was the same promise as Social Security. So if somehow you can break the promise of a calipers to buy a state or buy a city, that's the same legal process as saying Social Security could change. It really is. Yeah. Be, well, because I, I know people in the CalPERS system, they didn't pay into Social Security That's because right. they this were promised it. CalPERS. That's right. So the fact that they can renege on that is terrible. That's right. So, you, you know, you're, you've got, on the one side, you've got, let's help let's help people that are not here legally. Let's have a certain age range, have insurance and all that. That's just going to start being perceived as really unfair, and it could be, it could be very contentious. So like I say, next year is going to be quite the year for, for election. Well, one of the things I'm going to ask everybody, you know, depending on the kind of activity you're doing, you need to belong to one of those organizations because they are on the forefront of making sure that the electeds understand. I mean, electeds have to know a little bit about everything, and they're making decisions that, they, that sound really good, but they may not understand the ramifications of what it is. And there's a, a, about a, a month ago, we had Nima with Garassi Law Firm on talk about Florida and how he was part of the, the crew that went down to Florida fighting against, um, there was one particular congressional member down there who was fighting for any loans captured under consumer law. So business purpose loans, real estate investors, and hard money were, I mean, they were going to require basically an audit, <laughs> uh, making it very unattainable if you were a smaller private lender and you weren't doing consumer loans. So we're under some of those guidelines now, and the reporting and the expense is just... It's a lot. It if is. you're a small firm, forget about it. So, you know, one person knowing what they're talking about and being able to communicate the impacts that that has from a very d- data-driven perspective is really important. And on the lobbying front, there are it, there's going to be some opportunities specifically in 2020 because a lot of vacation rentals are, are probably going to be outlawed in a lot of California cities. Um, one of the things that we'll cover um, is RENA. Uh, those are the affordable housing goals for California. I'm not going to beat it up, but the, the the laws that went into effect for ADUs, basically the state said, hey, if you allow these ADUs to go through, we're going to give you permission to count these towards your arena goals. I think there's something only like six cities that are compliant with their affordable housing goals for the entire state. So this is going to be really important. So this could take off. What real estate investors need to understand is the process of getting down at the local level and meeting with the planning department the council members, uh, the planning commissions, and saying, hey, the state in this bill suggested that allow me to split up my apartment units by 25% and I can incorporate some affordable housing in this because I'm turning a three-bedroom, um, splitting them into three single, and I can charge less for that for a micro unit. So we want to cover those things because I don't think real estate investors know what the process is or uh, yeah, how no, important the next year is going to be. Yeah, no one else is talking about this space either. So, no. you know, when you say okay, gosh, it's hard to find a deal. Well, you might own a deal. Yeah. You might own something you can go, wow, I could get three more units out of what I own. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> and and in combination with opportunity zones, for real estate investors who are just diehard Californian, they want to stay here. There's money to be made in any market. It might get more difficult, but we also have I buyers. So that's going to be part of the conversation is just, this is the reality of 2020. You've got at least four big tech companies and more real estate firms throwing in their, their hat in the ring. There's just an article that came out on Inman today. We're taping this on Wednesday about how they made up, um, it was a 5% of the market in Phoenix and one other city. So they're increasing. This is, this is a new pathway to speed, uh, flexibility, privacy, you know, everything that a real estate investor offers, they're going after the easy ones right now. So mm-hmm. those are sort of off our table. So that's why I think starting in 2020, we just need to be thinking a lot more about creating the deals instead of necessarily finding them. One of the things Florida does right is it, it just attracts a lot of migration. Yep. And a lot of great migration with money. Mm-hmm. And the, the price is still very stable. And we have this relationship with the builder that we've been growing and refining that process. You've been very involved in that to where we have, oh, we have a lot of units mm-hmm. uh, in process and we expect that to grow in 2020. So that's, that's exciting because that's a, that's a chance to 
1031 exchange into something at a wholesale number that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, especially for, I mean, we get to talk to, I've learned more about estate planning than I've ever thought I would <laughs> in the last 24 months. It's been it's been a lot of fun and really cool to help clients. And it's not easy getting through build exchanges in 180 days and making sure that that happens. It's been very rewarding to be part of. And I love building. I have, I've always been fascinated with the building side. So this is fun. So... Well, the California stats too. I mean, that's something we look at and we have formulas for, you know, where we are and we've never had this, these set of charts with this result. Yeah. So when you go year over year with the charts that we've had, that's never happened. So it's going to be just interesting to see what, see what occurs after 2020. And then if you start incorporating any more negative stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, you could have people with some serious money go, okay, you're going to raise my apartments tax it's going to triple. Um, and if you can change that Prop 13, I, I'm really wanting to know if we vote against Prop 13 and it gets approved by the governor six months later, is that even possible? I want to know if that's possible. The timelines, how quickly it could happen. Well, I just want to know if it's possible. Does all you have to declare an emergency and then it happens? Maybe. That's Well, that'd be really important to know. All right. The, um, the profits and um, progress, uh, it's taking a look at uh, maybe things that we might not be thinking as far as real estate investors to monitor. So this is where we're going to include in 2017, I did a chapter for a timing report on technology, mm-hmm. talking about everything from nanotechnology to 5G to blockchain, sort of where those technologies are going to land and how it can speed up progress and markets that have things like 5G how quickly it can and will change things. And I think we're being made more aware of it now because of the conversations in China Mm -hmm. and some of the political turmoil out there with the uh, social uh, recognition, the face scanning. And in China, if you jaywalk, your picture appears on a screen and you get points dinged. And you don't get on the train that day. Correct. And the point system, depending on your social credit score, basically is dictating whether or not you get specific jobs, you get to travel, you get to take the train. It's... It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, For you tech nerds out there, there's a a really good book I just finished called The Big Nine, and it talks about BAT versus the G Mafia and sort of the U.S. versus China's development of technology and how U.S. is already behind, which is really frightening. Um, Anyway, we're not going to have time to go into that too much in this, but we are going to have the technology conversation when it comes to progress and looking at things like transportation. So the panel we're putting together is how can mom and pop real estate investors identify opportunity because you see commercial development or specific stores come into play where to find little hints that development is uh, coming should be sort of interesting and fun. Yeah. Turmoil sounds like a really dangerous word, but every time there's turmoil, there's always great opportunity for people that are understanding where those opportunities land. Yeah, I'm so excited. So, I mean, the biggest change is that we're we're sort of doing our first hybrid event. This is, uh, we decided to completely change the structure. So this isn't going to be a just timing event because so much of that wild card information is really important to this conversation. So for those of you who are subscribers with us, you're going to get an email from me today where I think you'll be, you know, really, really happy of the number. And then for people who have never attended any of our timing stuff, this is their opportunity. It's basically for a single person. It's 447 if they sign on before January 10th. And it includes all year the subscription to our portal and the live event. What's cool about that is just because you're a subscriber to the portal doesn't mean we're going to give you access to all this market timing information. Just to make that clear, there is going to be a specific, a special live attendee sort of section of the portal just for this content. But for those who are subscribers, they get an early and first discount kind of concept. But for those who are coming on for the first time, they also get access for the entire year to all of our how to information, which is cool. And the quarterly newsletters. This means that the live event, I'm so worried we're going to just so go over on some of these panels because it'll be interesting and we'll take a lot of questions. We might not have time to cover some of the chapters, but having the ability and the technology now in house to do the live webinar and the quarterly newsletter and have people participate live is so fun and cool. So that's, that's what's exciting about the day is that some of it will write itself. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we won't be sure what the answers are on some of the questions. We don't know what the answers are. That's why we want to ask them. Yeah, and that's what the, having the experts there who are at the forefront of making things possible is just, uh, it's going to be cool. I'm just really thrilled. So I think it's going to be a really, really fun day. Um, <laughs> we have so much work to do. <laughs> yeah, mostly, mostly you. <laughs> 
Well, it's definitely a lot more data. I mean, what I've spent the last year doing, starting last January, I attended the Consumer Electronics Show, specifically studying technology from, it was funny, I think my favorite moment at CES last year, I was at a robotics session. I went through the healthcare track and the robotics track. And I, I stood up and asked the questions of roboticists. Hey, I'm a real estate developer and I write for these different outlets. Do I need to worry about anything building homes that are more, to make them more robot friendly? And they sort of all laughed or like, that's a first. I'm like, well, I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Is tile okay? They're like, yeah, just, you know, the multi-level steps are going to be a problem for your Roomba for now. But uh, <laughs> that's funny. And then going to the International Builder Show and seeing the technology trends and what you think is going to stick and do I need a talking toilet or not. But um, a lot of these associations also collect such a huge amount of really great data. Um, so if you're doing rehabs or you're building new houses, understanding what the consumers are wanting by demographic, man, it's just such good content. So we're going to be bringing a lot of that for the first time at this event too. That's great. The, also the wild card Usually that's a pretty futuristic look. Yep. This time it feels like it's not. This time the wild cards feel a little too cl a, a little, little close. close. <laughs> Where the hair on my neck's going up, I'm looking at that going, wow, those could actually become some game changers inside of two or three years. Yeah, we've I think we've said on the show recently that, you know, 50% of the conversations I'm taking about people interested in going with us to Florida, it's it's they're worried about a recession and they've had a great ride. Right. And they're sort of on to their last phase of the owning physical real estate aspect of their career. The other half is just politics. They're out of California. They're so tired of it and they don't know what's coming and they're getting out while getting's good. <laughs> so um, it just, it definitely feels the, like the political angle is causing a lot of duress. You know? Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a good safe defensive move. Yeah, it really is. You were asked, um, um, I think uh, we spoke at SDCIA launching a new talk, your six things to succeed in 2020. I think my favorite question was, when's the next recession and will it be as bad as the l next downturn? <laughs> you must be getting that a lot these days. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting is it's the, sa it's the same thing we're going to cover. If I look at the real estate charts, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. If I look at the other nonsense, the answer could be definitely yes. And faster than you want it to. <laughs> yeah. There's some things that, I mean, there's some really bright people we we came up that word turmoil, I did, originally. I've heard it out of the mouth of two very, very intelligent people I pay attention to last night watching watching YouTube for about two or three hours, listening to these guys talk about the ETFs and the corporate bond world and how mm -hmm. how dangerous that stuff is. And they used both used the word turmoil, and I'm going, wow, that's a strong word. Yeah, the last loan I got on, on an unwarrantable condo in... Uh California made me go, hmm, I actually said, I don't even want that much leverage. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. I didn't, they made me go through the process. I still definitely had to qualify, but um, for a long-term loan, I'm sure there's people rolling their lives like, aren't you a hard money lender? <laughs> Trying to lock up as long as, as much long and low on some of the things I plan on holding long-term as possible right now. But uh, I don't feel like it's gotten crazy, but it's definitely gotten looser, put it that way. There's a lot of very smart people trying to figure out what's going on with the repo yeah. lending. Every time I turn into the news and I, I can't keep up, another $90 million. I'm like, was $90 billion. I was like, is that a B from like yesterday or yes. is that a week ago? There, another really smart guy said within two weeks that could be $500 billion a week. Now, something... Does it get paid off? Are we talking about like a new pile of $500 billion? A new pile... Fed, that's QE4, but they don't want to call that. Oh, geez. But that's, okay, so what the heck is going on? I've, I literally have at least 200 pages on my desk to read about that before I comment on it. So that's not going to be a chapter, right. but it'll be part of what we talk about in the wild card. Okay. Well, we are covering some new ground. I am very excited. Um, We'll probably have a, a webinar a little bit closer so, like we typically do sometime in January before the 10th. Probably have to be back because I'll be in Vegas, hopefully for the Consumer Electronics Show this year. When I get back, uh, we can go through and have a live webinar so people can ask questions. Um, 
we typically make one of the newsletters free. We'll see if we'll do sure. that, but um, go through the table of contents of what to expect. Cause uh, for the timing fans, we're still covering a lot of the real estate data. You're going to get the same charts um, that you're used to getting updated. Um, we're just adding a lot of the how to site on the back end, and then we'll be with you all year with the newsletter. So sometimes topics we don't get to cover in depth. We might just do a little bit later in the year. Correct. Very cool. Um, the, right. the Norris group.com forward slash turmoil. There's a big banner on the front of our website. And if you have questions, just call us in at the office and talk to Joey and he can answer questions. And we hope to see you February 1st in Riverside at the Riverside Convention Center all day. All right. Look forward to seeing you guys. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE license 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com.